Okay, we're recording. Okay, wouldn't it be nice if I had the agenda right in front of me? This is it for today. Yes, I got the agenda. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I shall take attendance, I guess. And um, I, Dorothy Pam, am present. And uh, Anika Lopes. Present. Uh, Andy Steinberg. Present. Shalini Balmill. No. Present. Anna, Anna Dejan Dejan. Present. And we are uh, visited by Jennifer Taub, and we have our staff liaison, town manager, Paul Bachelman, and our source of all wisdom, Athena, the goddess. So we're ready to go. I can't tell. Oh, and Guilford Mooring looking like a, what is it? What is that? I can't tell what that is, that picture. I think he has a traffic circle there. That, that's a New Zealand traffic circle. Okay, because it kind of looked like a motorcycle, but uh, a vehicle for transportation. You need to remind okay. us it's New Zealand. Oh, okay. New Zealand. Very good. All right. So um, we are open to public comment. I have no idea if there's anyone in the public. Let's see if there is any attendance. There is one attendee, uh, Lynn Griesmer, who is will reveal herself whenever she wants to make a comment, which we will welcome. Um, does uh, anyone want to make a comment at this, mo at this moment? Um, no? Okay, so I guess that public comment for this matter is over. If we see, deem it appropriate, we will have public comment again uh, later in the meeting. Um, we're number one on our agenda today is water regulations. And we're very lucky to have uh, Guilford Mooring here to tell us where we are. And this part of the meeting will be run by committee, TSO committee member, Anna Devlin Gauthier. So I turn it over to you, Anna and Guilford. Guilford, do you want to tell us where we are? Or do you want me to jump in? You talked to uh, Amy, she, she got you. I did, I wasn't, I wasn't sure if you had something you, you wanted to say first. So just check in. No. All right. So folks, um, I, I know this came in a little late, but Amy did a great job um, synthesizing kind of our main decision points for the water regs. Um, and she also gave us a full run through with all of the comments. Um, my only disclaimer is that, well, on the document, it looks like I made all the comments. Those are a combination of, of the comments I received. Just didn't want people to think I was that meticulous. Uh, so, so what Amy did is she synthesized this down into kind of three main decision points, which are ownership, dispute resolution, and then water use restrictions. Um, and so I figured we would go through these one by one uh, and uh, discuss kind of where we are. And then my thought, and I guess I'm looking to Guilford or Paul or Athena on, on, for confirmation on this, is that once we decide in kind of discussion, uh, I can go back or Guilford can go back or whoever can go back and edit the policy to reflect the decision that we make. Does that seem, okay, great. Um, no, who, it makes more sense probably for Guilford or Amy to do that, but I'm happy to, yeah, great. Okay, just confirming that that was the plan of action. All right. So let's let's just jump right in. Um, we're going to take these in biggest to smallest order. So the first one is ownership. Basically, the question we're trying to answer is who owns the water service and where does ownership change from town to owner? We've discussed this before. Um, so this is really a confirmation of what we discussed before um, for water. And then we'll also repeat it for sewer if that's what people want to do. So that's the, the second part of the decision. So the current policy, just to reiterate for folks who, who may not remember, sorry, there's some chaos happening here. The current policy is that the town only owns the large diameter public water line and the owner, the property owner owns the entirety of the water of the water service line, um, which includes all, big word I don't know, appurtenances, 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 whatever. Uh, thank you, which is the curbs, curb box, the curb stop, uh, corporation, et cetera. The exception to this is that the town owns the water meter. So what we had discussed is switching it over at the property line, um, having it be that the town owns the corporation, the curb box and the stop and the pipe from, you need to settle yourself down, um, from the um, large cool. diameter water line to the property line. And then the owner owns the water line between the property line and the building. 
So that's that's where we're at so far. If that is the case, Amy, then provide a, it's like a fun little choose your own adventure story. Um, Amy, thank you for that. So the, uh, the, the decision we need to make, if that's what we want to do, which we've discussed that before. So I want to confirm that with a quick little straw poll. Okay. Um, then we need to clarify who owns the curb box and the stop if they aren't located at the property line. Um, and so I just want to clarify what that means. And I can give it my best guess, but where else would it be, Amy or Guilford? Like if it's if, if it's, it's in if, if it's in inside the property. property. Okay. So do you have a recommendation here, or would you like us to kind of do you know the merits of each option? Either DPW owns it regardless of where it is or anything that property. It's it's nicer if it stays if we have a if we have the property line as delineation. So if it's inside, if it's inside their property, we can re put a new one in at the property line when we do a re replacement or a repair. But if it fails outside, they have to replace the service and put a new one in or at the property line. That's kind of where. Okay. Okay. So that makes so, sense. Yeah, hey, gonna... yeah, I think so. Um, so Paul, what, did you have a question? So, so I thought that you don't you prefer the current policy, Guilford, or do you prefer the property line policy? Well, I don't. I don't think we're going to get our preferred policy where the where the resident owns the service all the way from the main to the house. So the property line is would be a nice demarcation line for us. So the, oh, sorry. Go so ahead, if the so if the curb is inside the property because of some reason it was easier to put in or something else um, at, at, at whatever time where someone actually replaces that part of the service or we have to replace something, it'll get moved to the property line. So if they replace their service on their side, they put it at the property line. If we replace the from the property line back to the main, we would put a new one in at the property line. That's okay. where we... And then you would be responsible for it. Correct. Okay, Dorothy? This is just clarification. I, I, from past conversations, uh, you don't want to get involved in changing things on private property because they could like it or not like it. And also, if things are in the road, which you would now own from this point on, other things that the town does could mess up the box. I think I remember that discussion. Um, so the new thing that I'm hearing tonight is that if a homeowner's box, I guess we call this the curb box, is inside their property line, the town would, at the town's expense or at the homeowner's expense, replace that box if requested into the road. Is That's where I need a little clarification, whether you would just do it or only if requested and who would pay for it. What we prefer to do is that we would only do it when we have to replace our section of your ser service line. Okay. And then if yeah. you have to replace your section of the service line, you would put the curb where it belongs at the property line and then run your new line to your house. That's what we would prefer. Okay, so there was a part where you, a minute ago where I got confused. So let's say I'm a property owner and you're not doing anything, but I've decided what the heck, I wanna get this out of my yard. And you pay a private contractor to move the box and you say, put it at the property line. What if you don't like the way they've done it? I mean, what? how do we know this is gonna be good or, the, or whether you have to redo it or, you know, you have to inspect it and say, yes, this is okay. Right? You would still, you would still have to get a permit from us okay. to renew and repair or replace or repair your, your service line. Okay. And then we do come and inspect those Great. that work. Okay. So that's, that's good. I understand that. I, I, that sounds good to me. Okay. So can I clarify one more time? So if the curb box breaks and it's inside the property line, the owner pays for the move the the to move it to the property line if the curb box needs to be repaired but the brake is outside of the property line then dpw would pay to move it yes okay anika i was wondering uh, excuse me if this has been said but is there a known or estimated cost for moving the curb box just curious 
No, there's, it, it, it all depends on how, it, it, it all depends on how much other work has to go with it. Um, actually relocating the curb box is the cheapest part of replacing, probably the cheaper part of replacing the service line. Okay. So um, do folks feel, TSO folks feel comfortable with that, that designation of if the brakes on private property, the owner pays to move it to the property line. If the brakes on outside of the property line, DPW would pay to move the curb box to the property line if needed. I, I think you really do have to add that the, this have, would have to be permitted and inspected by the town. Abs everything has to be, I'm pretty sure. There's nothing in here that doesn't. Um, to con to, I have a question. Why would, if the break is outside of the property line, would you just be taking advantage of that time when everything's dug up to move, the, to move something on the curb? Like, okay, great, thank you, just confirming. Um, all right, we did one. Uh, number two. Clarify what to do, for example, who or i.e. who owns it when the water line crosses over someone else's private property. So basically you're saying if it goes through the neighbor's yard to get to your property, what do you do? That's a good question. Um, what are the options? We've got, yeah, what are the options? Because I'm actually not sure what, how, what the possible. This, this was more looking at a clarification of if we're saying from your property line, mm -hmm. okay. you own it and anywhere else the town owns it. Do we say that or do we say once it leaves town property, it's the okay. property of the person whose yeah. service line it is? And this is a rare case, but there are cases <laughs> where it goes over someone else's property line and we just need clarification. My I like what you said. Dorothy, we have to raise our hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay. Dorothy, what's your comment? <laughs> um, I thought that what Amy said made sense. Changing those words, if it leaves town property. So I think, yeah, so, so Amy was giving us the option. So what I'm hearing you say, Dorothy, is that what you would prefer is that the town owns the extent of the town property, but then we still need to figure out the second part, which is, is it the person who's who it is servicing, or is it the person whose property it's crossing? Is that, am I summarizing that? No, you're saying it would either be the town regardless of if it's private property or the... Yeah, I guess the question is, let's say, Anna, that your line, you know, comes from the road, goes a little bit across Dorothy's property to get to yours. Does the ownership for you start when it gets on your property and therefore the town would own that part that goes over Dorothy's or does the town only own when it's in town property and you own that portion that goes over Dorothy's property onto yours? Because once it's off town land, it's no longer the town's. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And so I guess my, my question was, there's not a third option where Dorothy would own the part that's on Dorothy's property. And then, yeah, no. Okay. That face is enough of an answer. That's fine. Um, <laughs> you, you could do it to make it more complicated, but we would say no. I, I think that's super that, that would be really tough to have somebody assuming responsibility. Like, I don't know that you can get the third party to assume yeah. responsibility under there. They don't have any sort of easement or anything like that. Normally you would have an easement. Okay. Okay. Andy. So uh, can you describe a typical situation? Is this flag lots where it happens most frequently or is it some other si situation and how does how often uh, does it occur? Oh, Guilford, yeah, go ahead, sorry. I just, yeah. M most of the time it's a flag lot situation and there's some, for newer houses, it's mostly flag lot situation and there's some type of information in the deed that talks about sharing things. Um, so, but it, it won't talk about, it probably won't talk about the ownership we're putting into it right now. Um, then in the older sections of town, there are actually houses that run across, they have lines, they have sewer lines and water lines that run across each, other, each other's property because it was just easier to put it there. Um, our ancestors are really nice about the fact that if it was easy to do something, they usually did it. Um, that, um, so there are a few in the older section, but predominantly now it's in the newer newer flag lot situations and there's some other type of delineation or clauses in there that things are shared or something like that. Thank you. 
Um, Anika, uh, sorry, not Anika, Dorothy. Uh, in my previous house, we had such a thing that we had to leave a pond and share water with the people next door. We got along fine with our neighbor. The person who bought the house after it was war, absolute total war as to who's, who's flooded whose garage and you ruin my blueberry plants, et cetera. So in one of those cases, I would think there might be some, um, some body, some town body um, that would arbitrate it. In other words, you can't write rules because they're, they're, they're unique and weird if they're old, because this was an old, old property that I lived on. Um, you know, just say, um, if there are difficulties with, with the, the pipes being on several properties, then this would be referred to the arbitration of and list a couple of people. Because I just don't see how you can write rules for some of these crazy things that might exist from old deeds. I think we might have to though, Dorothy. I think that's what the point is, is that we have to make a rule um, about, Andy? No, go ahead, because I was gonna go back to the flag law. I don't wanna... Okay, um, Paul? So right now, whatever, right now we don't own anything that goes from the pipe, right? All we're do, all you're doing is saying we're going to go to the end of the town property line. Whatever rules exist now can just continue. <clears throat> you don't have to decide and change the rules for everybody. Mm -hmm. so you can just say we're taking on additional responsibility from the main line to the property, the end of the public way, and then we stop. And then whatever is pre-existing pre-exists. You know, people probably have rules with each other or whatever it is. I think. Yeah. That's you don't need to make a decision about this. Okay. And yeah. We don't want to be the arbiter between two property owners. No, mm -hmm. right. definitely. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, my inclination is to to leave it as the, the town owns to the end of the town property and then yeah, it goes from there. Uh Andy, tell us about uh, flat house. Um what you just said makes sense, but it does get complicated when you have a flag lot. Because the way a lot of flag lots I imagine are set up, and Guilford or Amy can confirm this, is that it runs from the street to the to a branch to the first house in from the street, and then at that point there's a juncture where the water forks off in two directions, and we would need to have language to clarify what's happening. So is there currently, to Paul's point though, this is currently the situation, right? If these currently exist, they're already not under town ownership. So there's already some sort of thing figured out about this, right? So Guilford, can you, or Amy, can you tell us what's the current means of navigating this? So for a flag lot situation, if it's a new flag lot, it's been done in the last 20 or 25 years, there will be an individual service running from the road to each individual house. What is shared is the location. Most of the time, these services will run pretty much close together and they'll just follow the driveway. And then when they get to the driveway, the services will go off to the houses. So if there's three, flat, three lots on the property, there'll be three individual service pipes leaving our main, one going to each house. Does that answer your question, Andy? Yeah, I think that does. As long as if that's, I guess the, the only question I would have left is if we ever come across an exception where it's not as described, do we have language that allows resolution? I don't know the answer to that. Or is it just need to have language as determined by DPW? subject to whatever the appeal process is we come to later. Well, right right now, the right now the language is it's the property owner's responsibility. So if we're just taking, like Paul said, if we're just taking it to the property line, that's all we're responsible for. And everything that's been in place up to now just stays in effect on the property lines that those property owners have to sort it out themselves. We can help them, which we often end up doing, but we want them to be the ones to make the recommendation on what they want to do. So are you comfortable with the way that the proposed wording is now to cover those situations? Because if so, then I'm okay with it. Yeah, so we're comfortable with you saying that we own only to the property line and then 
The rest Six. is the property owner. Okay. Okay. So the next question is um, uh, clarifying around transition and ownership. So reading from this wonderful document, prior to the town assuming responsibility, does the owner, so we're talking about if this, if this passes and we switch the responsibility of the town to the property line, does the owner need to one, confirm the location of the curb box, two, make it accessible, and three, investigate the water service location, size, or material, or does the town just, I love this. I love the way you phrase this, Amy. Or does the town, no, 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 it's, it's really valid. I, it's, I was legitimately, does the town simply blindly assume responsibility for all of these without documentation or responsibility on the owner's part? So basically we're saying, if we change this, what do property owners need to do to make sure that the town is able to take ownership? Is that right, Amy? Please tell me yes. Yeah, I can, I'll try not to get on my soapbox too much no, as it was good. It was about this, but I mean, obviously the, the fear is there's, you know, 20% of the houses where we don't know what's under the ground. We don't know if they're lead service lines. We don't know if their, you know, curb box is buried under their driveway is underneath a tree that nobody's done in a while. And my fear is all of a sudden the town is taking on all of this responsibility without knowing what's there. And so I didn't know if there was some sort of a transition plan where, yes, we'll take, we'll take responsibility for it, but is there a way to just, the homeowner who has supposed to be responsible for these things mm -hmm. as much as anything else in their house, Right. Is there some responsibility on their part to at least make these things accessible? Or are we going to be cutting down trees, cutting people's driveways, investigating all of this stuff because they didn't manage their resource? Yeah. And this has been kind of the known pinch point of this, one of the known pinch points of this transition. Um, so if we were to say the owner needs some responsibility in, let's start with the first one, confirming the location of the curb box. It, how, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here and I apologize to everyone who's now subject to my mind. Would it be as simple as the town sending out a notification and explaining to people how to find their curb box or is it something that DPW needs to come out and do for them? Like if you told me, if you gave me instructions right now, could I go find the curb box and make it accessible? You don't know, okay, because it's different. Oh, uh, she's pointing oh. to me. Oh, I was sorry to Guilford. You, you were pointing you off where my screen on my, my screen. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know how to answer the question, Amy. Uh, Guilford, and then we'll go to Anika. So it, it's it, sometimes it can be very difficult. We, we really kind of wanted to say this so people understood that there's this unknown out there. And if, if we accept this, there's this unknown. And we may not know because we didn't install all these services and we don't have records for everything. It's just sort of a, if you, if you, you know, the easiest way to do this is to say, we figure it out as we go along. The hardest way is for us to tell uh, customers, you figure it out and tell the town what's, what's going on. And we understand that, but I guess this really is meant to say that there is an unknown, there is some concern, but as long as we understand this and we tell people there's going to be some unknowns here mm -hmm. and we won't be able to immediately respond to everybody if there's a real, real problem. Um, that's really what we're all we're saying here. So if you say yes, we're responsible and the homeowner is just going to not, once we take responsibility, we have a responsibility. That's fine. And there's no way to, so, oh, sorry, Dorothy, I'll get to you in one second. There's no way to phase this in or like slowly in terms of saying where you go through and inspect and after you've inspected it. We it becomes the responsibility over the course of like a couple of years. That's not that's that's not a thing, right? It's um it is it could be a thing if we want to do it that way. But it's that's gonna take time. Yeah. Okay. Dorothy. I'm wondering, first of all, what are the rules for uh, buying a house? Um, what does what involvement does the town have, if any, in somebody's purchase of a house? Um, because if the town has some role. Could there be a requirement? Maybe there are requirements now that somewhere on the deed of the property, some of these facts should be noted or found. Um, and if you don't know, if you're buying an old house and nobody knows, 
um, would it then be the um, seller or the homeowner's responsibility to, because um, I mean, they can use metal detectors and stuff to locate this uh, as part of the um, being hooked up to the town water system under on their own bill. Um, we have no, we have no participation whatsoever except doing a final water read in a, in a property transaction. Um, so at so. that moment, then the final water read, the transition moment, is there something where you can say that um, you can look on your records and see if you have information on that property? And if you don't tell the homeowner, it's your responsibility to find out where your thing is. Because it wasn't done by the town, it's not in the town records. Yes, we could leave somebody a note saying that, yes. Or we could pass it to the, I mean, when we do the final reading, it's just passed mm -hmm. to the lawyers. They do the yeah. calculations. So there could be a, there could be a document we pass with the final reading saying, mm -hmm. we have no clue where, we, where your stuff is on your sur water surface. Okay. I would like to read exactly that, please. Uh, Andy. For current construction or recent construction, is that on plans that are submitted to the planning department? The location of the curb box. Go, Amy. Want me to talk about this? Yeah. So I'll say for even for any project that's happened, maybe for the last 10, 20 years, we probably have, as long as people pulled a permit, we've got great records on what's underground, where the curb box is, what the material is, and stuff like that. Granted, the property owner may or may not have actually maintained access to the curb box. So it could have been paved over or they could have planted a tree right next to it that has grown over it in, in time. But at least we've got records of that where the gaps and records are, you know, are some of the older stuff. Um, we do have any, any of those, um, it's called a water service card and any of those water service cards that we have um, you can actually view, we've scanned all of them and linked them into GIS. So you can actually go to the town's GIS um, and look on your property. And if we have that information, it's mm -hmm. scanned there and you can actually see um, measurements from two corners of your house that will tell you exactly where your curb box is mm -hmm. and where you tie into the water main. So for all of the ones that we have, they're scanned and they're publicly available. It's just that we don't have all of them. Mm -hmm. Anika? Okay, my mind is stuck on the curb box being underneath the driveway. Now, in the event, if, if it is, would it have to be dug up or could the homeowner have a new one put in? Okay. Those are both options. If, if, some, if a homeowner is re replacing their driveway, the easiest thing to do is to dig it up uh, install a new curb box that's accessible and put your driveway back in. But in that case, if it's under your driveway, you would be responsible because ideally your driveway is on your property. Right? That, that, to tell the truth, that's going to be one of those little gray areas where we sit down with the property owner and say, okay. we're responsible for this piece. Mm -hmm. You're responsible for that piece and it'll just have to go because they're responsible for their driveway up to the edge of the road. So right. they would be responsible for replacing the driveway. Would they have to dig it up or is there an option that they could have a different, like a new curb box installed? They, they could put in a new curb box if they wanted to. Without ripping up the old one. But we would have to, it would, it would, be, it would take some coordination, but it's possible probably to do that. So we're getting a little in the weeds on the curb boxes, which not which is fine, but I want to pull us back to the question here, which is really about this the transition period and the the unknowns that we're accepting as a town if we make this switch. So what is Guilford and Amy? I mean, you you were saying that the your prefer neither of them is ideal, but your preferred method would be to take things as they come up versus there is no preferred method. Yes, yeah, so this has been a big discussion. As much as you guys are discussing this uh, among yourselves, this was an even bigger discussion among our staff. And they're like, yeah. well, no, we want everything to know everything because otherwise we'll waste a lot of time trying to find stuff. And 
people will get upset at us because we can't shut things off. Um, so it is, it is a gray area. People, and my, my personal take doing this as long as I've been doing it, the easiest way to do it is just say, there's no, not gonna be a transition period. We're just taking it on and we take it on or we, and we go from there. Amy mm -hmm. says We disagree no. on this. <laughs> and it, it might be because a lot more of the guys have been freaking out in my office about this. Um, and like I said, and that's why I'm trying to capture at least really what the fear is, is that all of a sudden we're assuming the liability of not, you know, all of these resources that we don't know, you know, like at some point the homeowner in the past had responsibility for this stuff, whether they knew it or not, they had responsibility to maintain these items and it, they might not have maintained it. And now all of a sudden it's our problem that someone else didn't maintain their water service line and maybe it's leaking. You know, They didn't repair it for 50, 60, 70 years, but all of a sudden it's my problem because they just waited it out until we owned it. Um, okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm more just, I've, I've had a lot of my guys be very nervous about, about this. Seemingly validly so, um, it makes sense. Dorothy. So I wanted to reply to Anika. Um, right now, if somebody had the curb box under their driveway and they developed a leak, um, they're not only responsible for that, their driveway, the leak, they're re responsible for it. And my, I didn't hook up to the town till down the, you know, 90 feet down the hill on the corner of uh, Sunset. So we're limiting the homeowner is better off under this new plan, even if there are wrinkles is what I'm trying to say, because um, most people don't pay attention to this. Most people don't know where it is. I certainly never knew where mine was. And if something goes wrong, you have to dig it up and it has to be fixed. And the town is never going to pay for your yard, your lawn, where it is there. It used to pay, um, but now it's going to pay for up to your property line. So that is going to be a better deal for the homeowner than the previous plan. So unless we're gonna, I misunderstood something. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, we're gonna go to Shalini and then I have a I have a pitch on this one that I wanna run by Amy and Guilford. So Shalini. Yeah, I was uh, wondering, this was brought up, I think Anna, you brought it up, the trend, like there's an inspection. So the town takes over pending an inspection of you know whenever that, uh, that decision point arrives and so you have an option then to look at what are the costs, talk to the owner, everything before you. So there is some sort of an inspection or something that that the owner is then transferring it over to the town. I think my, my understanding is, is that, that, sorry, there we go. I, I don't know why I keep echoing for some reason. Um, mm. So my understanding is that the inspection is only if there's new construction or an issue. Um, but it, and in those cases, then, Yes. Um, I don't know, Amy or Guilford, if you want to respond to that, if there's anything I missed. Yeah, I mean, what, what, what's in this, this number three is you need to decide if you want us to have a transition period yeah. or we just accept everything once you approve this. That's really what you're asking for or what we're asking you. Is, yeah. Will there be a transition and then or we just take it on when it's approved. So I have an idea um, and I would love to hear Amy or Guilford. What if I can sit down with you, Amy or Guilford, whoever, and come up with like three different potential plans for this and bring those back to TSO to look at? Does that sound okay versus trying to hash out a transition? Or like whether, a trans okay, great. So we're gonna move past this one, but we'll come back to it and I'll reach out to one to you guys and um, set up a time to maybe just draft out some thoughts. Does that sound okay to other TSO folks? And that way we can, okay, great. So we're gonna move on to the second. Um, okay, see, we're still on question one. All right, next one no. is, oh, no, we're not. You're yeah, on we question did. two now. We didn't do, oh, that was the set was the other option. Thank you. All right, dispute resolution. This is the second biggest one. So basically we need to figure out what is the process for anyone to appeal a decision within these resolutions. This was something that was mentioned a whole bunch um, in one of the comments that we got, or one of the sets of comments we got. So options are, um, am I right? A and B are different options. So 
Option one is the DPW to the DPW superintendent to the town manager. So basically DPW issues the warning or the fine. It can be appealed to the superintendent and it can be appealed one more time to the town manager whose decision is final. Um, or it goes DPW initial fine complaint or appeal to DPW superintendent and then the, the further appeal goes to the town council whose decision is final. My understanding is the reason why the town council would be in that position is we are the water commissioners. Um, so that's why it would go. Those are the two potential avenues. Um, so folks thoughts on, I guess this is kind of getting into the role of water commissioners versus town manager in terms of where responsibility lies ultimately. Um, do folks have thoughts or opinions? Andy, I was hoping Andy would, I knew it. All right, Andy, what do you think? Yeah, I guess, I, I mean, I want to hear from Paul before we make a decision on this, but, you know, it's sort of like um, public ways policy where um, the council by the charter is the keepers of the public way, but we have delegated some authority to, as, as appropriate to the town manager. And um, it would seem that that is um, possibly a preferred um, option just for efficiency's sake, because um, if it's the town manager is making the decision, uh, he regularly works with the superintendent of uh, public works and uh, therefore uh, is in a position to really understand the issues and in in establish the communications. And it's a um, simpler process than delegating it to the council or a committee of the council uh, because we don't have the same level, future councils are not gonna have the same level of knowledge that we have right now. And so you have to be thinking to the future and it would seem that a future town manager's better place for the role, if Paul agrees, than having a future council take over that has not been involved in the development of these regulations and is unfamiliar with them. Yeah, um, Andy, I agree. I think my question is, Paul, do you realistically think you'd ever come to a different determination than Guilford in terms of the, if it goes from the, Guilford's nodding. But if it, I mean, is that, I guess I'm asking, is that a fair line, right? If it's all within the same reporting line, is that equitable or fair to the, to the person making the complaint? Well, ultimately you are the water commissioner, so you can choose. Um, you know, I, I think that it's a, just having a second bite of the apple by the applicant who feels aggrieved. Um, I think, you know, some people would prefer to have a bigger body, but, um, uh, you know, I think that, it doesn't matter to me, quite honestly. I don't think it's going to happen very often. Um, the issue for the council is that then it takes up time for the council and there's the educational component for the council. Yeah. Um, so whichever way you, it looks like Amy has an idea, but yeah, um, either one. Amy? I, I only wanted to point out, you know, I, I feel like the pros and cons of this, like Paul is saying, is if it goes to, to Paul, at least, you know, there's not the educational component um, of bringing up a council to, you know, kind of understanding what the rules are and what we've done in the past. But the flip side of it is, um, if it goes to the town council, then at least the person's heard in a public forum. And so they feel like there's not things done behind a closed door. So I, I feel like those are the two sides of the argument. Um, and I'm okay with whatever, as long as, you know, we're fair and consistent and there's a process. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this, Dorothy? Um, if the town manager wanted to, could he consult the town council? I think he can talk to us at any time, but I don't know. Paul? Yeah, yeah. obviously the town manager could, but I think you'd want to place it in one, one realm or the other and okay. not try to do a hybrid. Because I, I think it's tempting to say, let's do a hybrid. But I think you should say it's this body or this body and just and set up, leave it at that. Yeah. Well, for the in that case, I, I prefer what Andy suggested. I'm, I'm inclined that way as well. And I'm seeing nods from Shalini and Anika. Okay. Bang, done. Hey, guess what? Question three. Um, so, so oh, before yeah. you go to question three, question oh, yeah, three. Sorry. 
No, no. Yeah, there's some follow-ups. Yeah. Do you want me to do the follow-ups first and then let you speak? Okay. So question two had follow-ups, which are uh, reasonable expectations for timing for each step of this process. So essentially, is this asking how much time does Guilford have to make a decision? And then if it's appealed, how much time does Paul have to make a decision? Okay. So how much time Guilford needs one day? Um, that was a joke. That was a joke. That was a joke. Uh, sorry. Can I choose which day it is? Yes, absolutely. So, um, <laughs> uh, two years away, how many days would be reasonable? I mean, is it a 30 day thing? Is this a two week thing? What I I'm not uh, having never gone through any sort of appeals process in town. I'm not sure if there are other, um, appeals processes that exist. Anika. Yeah, I was, I was just going to ask how long does this take now? I don't know if we have one now, do we? Yeah. No. Or something similar to compare it to. I mean, we don't we don't have a formal policy now, and it depends on what the what the person talking to us about, what kind of dispute we have going on. Um, most of them get handled pretty rapidly. There's very few that go much for very long. But I mean, if we want to say there's a you know you'll we'll give you a decision in two weeks or thirty days. I mean, we just want a number in here so people kind of have a expectation. This is the maximum amount of time it can be. Okay. And, and we can do it later if you don't want to weigh into this mm -hmm. um, minutia. No, I think we can figure something out or take your recommendation. My only concern is that it not, that it stops the clock on all the other timelines of if there's a dispute that it stopped the clock on payment and uh, deadlines and things like that. Dorothy. Um, I like the phrase um, not to exceed or up to 30 days, which means it could be decided quickly but it won't go more than 30 days. Do you believe that for both Paul and the DPW superintendent? Well, I would I would say, suggest it. And if they think that's not good, then they'll tell us right now. I just wanted, before we suggest it, I wanted to confirm that that was for both of them. Okay. So it would take, it could take oh, 60 days total to resolve it. Sometimes something might need to take 60 days, but the, the phrasing that Guilford had was, this isn't the time it will take, but no more than that time. Right. Or up Understood. Understood. Thank you. Well, Andy. I was just going to ask Guilford if there's anything in the, or Paul for that, uh, both, whether there's anything in the current tree regulations, which you have had more recent experience dealing with that you think is helpful to consider. Got any thoughts on trees? Paul, you're muted. Or Amy. I don't think there are any time constraints, Amy. No, I'm more we're just gonna ask, and this is my ignorance, but even if someone gets say a parking violation or a speeding ticket, like I don't know even what the resolution process is or the timeline is on that, but I wonder if that gives us an example. I think I, let me look into oh go ahead. I think it's 15 days. 15 days. Okay. Sure. Let me check. All right. So, Paul, while you check on that, are you checking on that now or do you want to? No. no. All right. Can I come back to us with that one? Does that sound okay? I'll confirm. We'll say 30 right up to up to 30, unless I look at all of the other processes and they're like two or 15. And if so, I'll come back. Okay. Let me write down that I have to do that on a look. Okay. Now, are we good to question three? And Guilford, you can give us. Okay, go ahead, Guilford. Tell us about question three, which is about water use restriction declaration. So just as you read this, this is a little different than the first two because this, this is not three options. These are three ways you can have any water emergency declaration. Okay. Thank and they're you. all kind of the separate. And Amy, can, Amy can speak to them specifically better than I can. Yeah, I don't know if you want me to drive you through them quickly. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Okay. So there's kind of three different ways that we might have water use restrictions that have to be declared. And so the first one is an emergency. And I'll tell you, we've had all of these recently, so we can tell you. Um, an emergency is like when we have a major water main break and we lose a ton of water in like a two hour period. And that's when we just need everyone to kind of tighten the belt um, not use water for a short period of time so that our tanks can recover and the system can recover. 
Um, and so that's that's the sort of thing we need to figure out who makes that and what time frame constitutes an emergency. Is it something where we think the system can recover in a day? Is it something where we think the system can recover in a week? Um, but that's that's an, uh, an emergency one. Um, the second one is we are probably in the next year or so we're going to get our next Water Management Act permit. And in that permit, it is going to be written in that when a stream hits a certain flow, you enact water use restrictions. We're going to have zero say in this. It's going to be um, driven by the state in our permit. Um, and so this one is more of a formality of who is the official body that's saying, based on our permit, this is what we're doing. Um, and so again, we just have to kind of know what the process is for that. But that's going to be one. I just want to be really clear that it's going to be out of our hands and it's not, it's not up for public debate. That's, that's permit um, state required. And then the third one is when we have a low water trigger. And I'll give you an example of that, which you guys are familiar with, which is even like this last fall where it wasn't even in a drought, but we had a couple of large water sources offline. And had we had a couple of warm days in a row, our water system was gonna be stressed based on the amount of water that we could provide. And so that's something where we said, we feel stressed based on the water situation that's going on and we need to do something outside of the permit. Um, and so that's where typically we know when that's coming, even if it's not necessarily drought related, we're watching all of these indicators and we at least have you know a couple of days, a week, a several weeks heads up on when that's coming but somebody does need to make the determination on that. So my thought when I was reading the, the third one is this is the sticky one for me is I think is easy to anticipate. My thought for the first two um, fellow TSO folks is that the DPW is the kind of authority on it. They make the decision, but they have to inform the town manager who has to inform the council. Um, sort of just like a, a heads up. Um, this kind of happens already, right? Paul tells us if, if water is getting shut off. so. Um, I think it's kind of just continuing that that practice. But in my mind, I'm comfortable having the the water experts be the people who say we're going to turn the water on and off. Um, the last one, you know, I I still don't. It's kind of the same situation as before, where town councils don't necessarily have the the expertise on this, and so I still feel more comfortable with DPW making the decision. But the last one feels like there might be a different role. I don't know. The last one feels like there might be reason to switch it up, but I'm not necessarily convinced of that. That's my that's my take on it. Uh, Dorothy. Well, I would want all three to be in the hands of the experts, but um, I'm paying attention to something Amy said earlier, which is the educational component. So I'm wondering if there's another th way that this is done by the DPW and the town manager. Um, but that we, he doesn't just read it in his town manager's report, but that there's a more formal presentation at the town council meeting. We don't vote on it, but maybe we assent or I don't, there's, I've heard, heard a term somewhere else in my life, and I don't remember what it is, where it's a more passive thing, but it's formal. You present the case, we get the ruling from the town manager and, and the DPW, um, and we like rubber stamp it or something like that because um i think the educational is is important i think people have to hear this but um you know i've been to enough meetings to spend a lot of time uh, talking about water on the finance committee to know that i can trust our dpw that they are going to do the right thing i can't say i can trust some future or random town council in the same way um, to right. preserve water because sometimes there's a cost to preserving water that some people don't want to pay. Dorothy, you, you're bringing up something interesting for me, which is that, is it the decision to do it or is the is the trigger point the decision, right? Like, I think that's, um, Amy, that was a half hand. I, I'm, I'm like, yeah. I'm kind of debating as we're going on because I get that this is a little bit minutia because there's going to be very few times where 
DPW maybe recommends something and the town council isn't going to agree or the town manager doesn't agree. I guess I just want to be clear on what the process is. Is the DPW just making a decision or is the DPW making a recommendation to the town manager or to the town council in some of these cases? So first two feel settled. Let me let me break these out. Do the first two feel settled for other folks as DPW is the authority, the decision maker, they inform the town manager who informs via email, not waiting for an e not waiting for a meeting, informs the town council if there are water use restrictions for emergency or water management act triggers. Does that seem solid to folks? Just for the first two, Dorothy. I can't see why the third is different. I really don't. Try. Okay. I think all three of them have the same standing. There is a very good reason to restrict water yep. that the people who run the system know the details about yep. and yep. that we have to do it. Okay, so Dorothy wants the third one to be the same way. Yes. Um, in my mind, the opinion, the difference is that there's weeks of lead up time and it's not triggered by a mandate or a, a, main, a main break or something, Paul? Yes, I think there are the, the first one, the A emergency, that's like, there's a fire, we have to take care of action. DPW should be able to do that instantaneously, you know, without question, we, yeah. you know, it's dropped, or we suddenly discover that the, it dropped. So that's, that's DPW, DPW acts notification to town manager, right? The other two, um, I think DPW acts and, and it gets you know, confirmation from town manager with notification to town council. So you want there, I think the idea is, is of this concept is to do a check and balance. Yeah. And so you want a second person to say, yeah, you're right, we should do this because it's, it doesn't, and the, and the key here and why town manager, not town council is that town council, there's always the public meeting posting, can you get a quorum? And, all, and if you don't get a quorum, you can't act. And so we're, we're stuck. So there you, you give it to the executive with notification. So I think that on B and C, you'd say, town, you know, DPW um, makes a statement, gets, you know, confirmation from the town manager with notification to the council. That would be my suggestion. Yeah. I'm, I'm more comfortable with that than just inform. I think confirmation from town manager makes sense for the last two, or even just the last one, but last two is fine. Because mm -hmm. um, because the second one, it doesn't matter. I mean, whether or not you confirm it, Paul, it doesn't really matter. It still has to happen. Uh, okay, so right now, as written, it is the authority to make the determination for one, two, and three lies with DPW. Uh, for emergencies, they, they tell the town manager who tells the council. For water management act triggers, they tell the town manager who tells the town council. For low water triggers, they confirm with the town manager who signs and rubber stamps it, um, and then the town council is informed. Does that seem... He okay. said notified. In the last one there, Paul had mentioned that there was a confirmation versus just an information. Right, confirmation town manager, notification town council. At least that's what I wrote down. Yeah, I just said inform, but yeah, notifi notify works too. Okay, we have dealt with one, two, and three. I have a little homework to do. Um, I'll reach out to Amy and Guilford to talk through this. And I'm only five minutes over my uh, a lot of time. So with, everyone's uh confirmation i guess i'll use that word i will uh we'll wrap this up for today and guilford and amy thank you so so much for all of your work on this i really appreciate it it's been a joy thank you anna yay good job team all so, right Dorothy, back to you uh, one, quick question, one quick quick question for anna uh let me just think yeah. it was so clear a minute ago um, okay the question that had been asked at the beginning we're doing just water or are we doing water and sewer? Um, there were, I, this has been raised a couple of times, I, I think, as if we could. And so I guess I'll ask, is there any reason why we can't say some of these, the decisions that we're making would be the same for sewer as for water? Some of the decisions that we are making could, should and would be the same for sewer as they are for water, um, because it could get confusing if they are different. But um, until we have, an opportunity to, to look at those and ensure that we don't have that, if we've already answered the questions, great. And I'll bring those answers to you. Um, mm -hmm. And if we haven't answered the questions, then we'll discuss them separately. Okay, good. Does that sound okay to you, Amy Guilford? Or are you thinking something different? Yeah, I was gonna say, I can 
knowing these decisions tonight, when we go through and answer questions and make edits to the sewer, I'm going to assume the same, and that'll be our starting point, but we can discuss if there's sticking points where we need to make a different decision, but this gives me a starting point. Great. Perfect. All right. Great. Okay. With that, thank you, Gilford and Amy. I think you're free to go. I don't know if Gilford. No, they're not. Uh, no, they're I not. think Amy might be. Amy might be free Amy to go. That's right. But Guilford is definitely here for discussion of Lincoln Avenue. Lucky and... duck, Guilford. Thank you, Dorothy. I'm going to stop talking now. But okay, but you're staying. You're not. Uh, yeah, of course you know, I'm I staying. Too much on it is that I, you know, you're still here. Okay. I'm staying absolutely. Bye, Amy. Perfect. Bye, Amy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, so we now have bringing up again the question of parking regulations on Lincoln Avenue between Amity and McClellan Street, and I think this was um, reactivated by Andy. Um, who, um, so why don't I have Andy speak first? And we have uh, Jennifer Taub, who is working on this issue too. So um, is that okay, uh, Jennifer, if Andy speaks first? Oh, sure. No, I was gonna say, okay. I, I, I really found your previous you know, discussion fascinating. So I'm glad I was here for that. I, I, I don't really have much more to say. I really think we should turn it over to Jennifer pretty quickly. Because what happened in the last council is really what it's going back to, because I'm the carryover member from the prior TSO to this TSO. And um, in the what uh, we developed a series of criteria to examine when uh, we look at uh, these kinds of uh, parking restriction requests or uh, referrals. And it was a pretty comprehensive um, document that was developed by the committee and then used now to zero in on Lincoln Avenue. Uh, it, it was used in the Lincoln Avenue discussion. And uh, we went through the list and um, compared what we could determine to be the facts from um, testimony we had received at public hearing and at other points from uh, comments from Guilford and uh, Paul and others. And uh, we um, then had a recommendation that was made by uh, Councillor Ryan uh, that was essentially uh, saying that for the relevant section of Lincoln, that there would be a, a parking restriction during the time that the university is commonly in session. I don't have the exact wording in front of me. And uh, that went to the council and the council on a tie vote because it required a majority to prevail. One absent. Uh, yeah. The motion did not carry. Uh, there was uh, somebody absent or can't remember what the circumstance, but it was a tie vote. And uh, the one person who definitely um, changed vote from the committee to the um, council meeting was because during that interim period, we learned that Lincoln Avenue was going to be closed off um, at uh, the um, at its end in the last um, section as the um, construction began on the apartment development there and uh, was possibly going to be permanently closed. We weren't sure. And uh, so the, um, the argument was essentially that the factual circumstances, the factual analysis that was made was based upon what was available for information uh, when the road was open and the, it should be reevaluated um, after the road was closed. And uh, there was one other piece that was relevant to it because in no time did we get into the question of consideration of what might be the effects on neighboring streets if that mm -hmm. decision was made. So there was uh, two things missing. And uh, when I've spoken about this with Jennifer, I said, well, uh, she's closer to looking at Lincoln Avenue on a regular basis than I am for obvious reasons. Okay. And uh, that uh, 
therefore, if there were changes in factual circumstances, then it would be valid to bring that back uh, and ask for reconsideration against the criteria because we will have essentially done the experiment that the one deciding vote on the um, council last time was most affected by. And uh, so that was the factual, that was the background piece and it kind of uh, therefore unfortunately left it for Jennifer to make the next call. And that's why I said, I'd rather have her pick up on it than me because she has the observations that now would be relevant to the discussion. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, and are we ready now for Jennifer to make a presentation? I see. Thank no you, way. Andy. That I really, I guess I was deciding whether just go in, I have like three short slides or if I should provide that context, which you just did. So I really appreciate it. And I just, I won't go to the, you know, slides, but um, to, to respond, to take it from where Andy left off is they did close uh, the intersection at um, Massachusetts Avenue and Lincoln Avenue in November. So we have like nine months, you know, a semester and a half of school since it was closed. And it did not change the parking situation at all because you could, you can still walk or ride your bike, which people do take their bikes out of the car there's pedestrian access to campus. So it didn't change the situation of people parking. And then, um, and it was almost more crowded than ever, probably because they closed some lots on campus. And then Paul in his town manager report just this past Monday, so I had never heard any, I thought that it would be only temporarily um, closed the intersection at Lincoln and Mass Avenue. Because uh, when it was explained to us by the university, they said it's only temporary during the construction. And in fact, in Paul's report this week, under university and college update, it did say that UMass has no plans to keep that intersection closed. So not only did the closure not cause any ebb in the parking, but the intersection is gonna open at the very time, although it may open before the dorms open, but presumably at the same time, there's 800 new residents coming to the street. And that is a lot more cars that will be traversing. And I might add that a lot of the streets surrounding Lincoln, like McClellan, um, Cosby, Fearing, already have parking restrictions. So I could see maybe some spillover onto Sunset, but we're one of the last streets in this particular neighborhood that doesn't have any parking regulations. And we are the main thoroughfare from Amity and Route 9 onto campus, because we, we're a direct route onto campus at sunset not that that would really deter people but you do have to make a few turns so people don't tend to take sunset to get to campus they take lincoln so i um just you know wanted to provide a little um kind of overview of the background where we are now and what our request is and i was going to ask athena so i i've actually never shared my screen so i don't know if i should do it or athena has the slides I have them ready if, if you'd like me to put them up. Yeah, if you don't mind, that would probably be easier so I have to take up people's time. I'll, I'll try and be quick about this. Thank you very much. Oh, so fast, yeah. That's fast. I don't know if you can see, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Great. So basically, and, and again, when I talk about some of these uh, you know, numbers, this came from the work that DPW did when it was before TSO um, during the last council session. So the source of, the situation, the problem or challenge we find is that Lincoln Avenue is classified as a collector roadway. And during an evaluation previously conducted by DPW, it was determined that Lincoln Avenue is actually not wide enough to accommodate two-way traffic and a parking lane. That the street is 24 to 25 feet wide and the recommended width for a street to have two -way, accommodate two-way traffic and a parking lane is 27 to 32 feet. And as so after the previous TSO studied the matter, uh, referred it to DPW, it came back and then they took a vote recommending to council that they approve the TSO's recommendations. So in an October 15th, 2021 memo, memo from the then TSO chair Evan Ross to town council, he said, given 
Lincoln Avenue is a collector roadway with high traffic flow and pavement width that does not meet the recommended pavement width for two-way traffic plus parking lane. The criteria suggests that parking should not be allowed on Lincoln Avenue. And again, so that's even if it wasn't the main connector road from Amity and Route 9 to mm -hmm. UMass. So cars begin to arrive on uh, Lincoln between Amity and McClellan, and that's the parking part of the, um, the east side of Lincoln between Amity and McClellan. And that, that's the part of the street that has no parking regulations now around 8 a.m. on most weekdays and remain there until late afternoon, early evening. And it's not unusual for vehicles to remain on the street overnight. So I was getting emails from residents saying they're, they're parking overnight. And if it's snow, it even can cause um, you know, difficulty for the plows. So I emailed Paul and you know, I said, oh, car cars are parking overnight. And I think we all assumed that wasn't allowed, but it turned out it, it is allowed. So you can basically park there. There's no restrictions. You can park 24 seven for weeks at a time. So when UMass is not in session, there are rarely any parked cars. So this is not a place where people are parking who are you know, patronizing downtown businesses or even working downtown because when school is not in session, there's no cars. So it really is all parking for the university. Um, so it's a, it, you know, the feeling is that during the academic year, particular, you know, that again, we kind of function as a parking lot and the concern is I guess even greater um, when the eight, additional 800 residents move on to the street as I can definitely see where, you know, there's students in the new dorm and, you know, let's say somebody's going for spring break home with a friend and they could just leave their car for the entire week or two on the street. And, um, you know, as I went into detail in the previous, you know, when I was um, speaking before the full council, as it got referred to TSO is it's not, I mean, nobody cares that it's unsightly that the cars are parked there, but it's really become a problem for the people who live on the street. I mean, it's become a problem for two-way traffic. That's the first problem. So that's everybody. There is not room to, for two-way traffic around the parked cars that the school bus driver to Wildwood had to actually change the way he approached the street because he was having to stop and wait for cars to pass over the parked cars. And he was getting behind schedule, but that the cars park right up to the driveway curbs and all the driveways are narrow one car driveways. They're one car in width. And the residents would have been happy if there was some way to mark the curbs or keep people from being able to park right up to the driveways or just over them, but that's um, very difficult for the town to enforce. So that kind of stopgap measure we were told isn't really um, an option that we would have. Okay, so the next slide. Thank you, Athena. Great, thank you. So um, again, some of this is repetitious, but um, looking forward, we have two new dormitories that are currently under construction. When the dorms open in fall 2023, there will be 800 additional residents living on Lincoln. Um, so in anticipation of even more cars parked closer together on this narrow residential street, uh, there's really a feeling that it's more critical than ever that some level of parking management be adopted. And I think also, as you have all these cars and their guests coming to look for parking on the street, that I, I can't even really imagine what the, what the traffic situation is gonna be once the dorms open. And not every student will have a car, but you know, if, if even half of the 800 did and they have guests, um, you know, 800 new residents on the street and they, they really are on Lincoln Avenue they're in the neighborhood more than they're actually on what we consider the campus. And no resident has ever objected to the dorms being there. We do live near campus, but we feel like we have to do some planning for this. So as per the town managers, um, again, report to council on June 27th, the university represent, quote, the university representatives indicated they have no plans to close Lincoln Avenue. It's intersect with Massachusetts Avenue. Therefore, we'll continue to function as this main access uh, north south route to and from Route 9 and Amity Street and that we anticipate hundreds of additional cars traversing the street and vying for parking on a daily basis. I actually, you know, again, we're just requesting parking restrictions during the weekday, although with the new dorms, I would imagine there'll be demand um, on weekends, but, you know, 
two days will be better than seven. Okay, so thank you, Athena. I think I'm at the last slide. And this really gets to um, the request. And um, the request is specifically what TSO, what the last TSO was asking uh, the town council to approve. So um, the request would be to for TSO to recommend that town council adopt the following regulations for Lincoln Avenue, which were approved by the prior council's TSO in October, 2021. And that this is what they came up with that parking be prohibited as a tow zone from September 1st to May 31st, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 a.m. And those restrictions exist on other blocks mm -hmm. on Lincoln Avenue and some of the surrounding streets. On the east side of Lincoln, from a distance of 200 feet north of Amity Street to 60 feet south of McClellan Street, that parking be prohibited as a tow zone from September 1st to May 31st, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. on the east side of Lincoln from a distance of 60 feet north of McClellan Street to 30 feet south of Fearing Street. That restriction's already in place and parking prohibited as a tow zone on the east side of Lincoln Avenue from Fearing to South Hadley, to North Hadley Road, excuse me, which is almost right on the campus. And that restriction is already in place. So um, in speaking with Lynn, she suggested that, you know, we request that TSO hold a public hearing on this request. And then based on how you vote after that hearing, uh, hopefully it would be <laughs> to recommend, you know, uh, that you would refer this matter to the town council for final approval. Thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions, of course. Okay. Um, I had a question on that slide. First, it said town zone, which when you mean tow zone, that's a typo. It but is a my typo, question was on the last two things, the um, on Mac north of McClellan and on Fearing on East Hadley, is that... You said that's already in place. I just, I got confused there. Um, I, I understand from Amity up to uh, McClellan. I understand right. that. But then the part north of McClellan, is that the rule that you read? You, it sounded like you said that that's already it in is. place. So I, maybe Paul can weigh in. I've always been confused, frankly, whenever I read it, it repeats what is already in place. So I live between McClellan and Fearing, I'm just like a block, two blocks from campus. So there, is, although my driveway is on Cosby, so this really doesn't impact me. But there is already no parking weekdays going north. So this, I think, when the town initially did that, they thought that they were, they knew that was there was going to be a horrible parking situation within a block or two of campus. So I think in Paul, you might, I don't even know if this predates your your coming to town, but. I think they thought we will restrict parking on the two blocks closest to campus and people won't park further and walk, but oh, that has not been the case. They park all the way to Amity. So, um, but again, so I don't actually know why they repeat mm -hmm. what they're gonna keep in place. So that's why this is only asking for the restrictions in this long part of the street where there's cars bumper to bumper every weekday during the school year that's really impeding traffic and people getting in and out of their driveways. And I mean, just as one example, there was, um, an ambulance had to come twice over a period of months to the same residence. The ambulance couldn't pull into the driveway of the home because the cars were blocking it enough that the ambulance couldn't get onto the driveway. And there were so many cars parked on the street, they couldn't park. They literally had to park like almost down the block and it was, it, it was a very um, serious situation. So that's what we're kind of faced with every day. So can we have an answer from Paul and Guilford on why those last two paragraphs are still here, if in fact it's already been done? Um, Guilford, is that a hand there? It is, sorry. Okay, I'm on. It, it was just to clean things up and just to have it restated, this is what we were gonna do. Okay. All right. So when we present it to town council, do we still present it with all three paragraphs and say two of these have been passed and one hasn't or? No, I would recommend 
doing a complete, this is going to be a complete new parking regulation and doing it for the whole length. So it's clear cut. This is the parking regulation and. Okay. I see. So keep it as, as typed up by Jennifer, the whole thing. Okay. And Paul, is that your understanding too? Okay. Very good. Okay. So I think Shalini, you have a question. I'm going to write this down. Yeah, I was wondering what uh, the Transportation Advisory Committee, what they feel about, because the note says that they did not offer a comment, and I wonder if we could hmm. hear from them. Well, um, I did notice that there is an attendee, Tracy Zafrian. Now, I, I don't know what the etiquette of whether mm -hmm. I can call upon that or, um, you know. So if it ever went to TSO. TAC. Yeah. The I mean, TAC. I mean, TAC. I yeah, think I that ever... might be why that that's a, but challenging. It's really important that clarification that you're asking there, and I really appreciate it. Um, so uh, whether they have come in or not, uh, TAC hasn't met recently. Um, Although Tracy has her hand up. Oh, great. Okay. So let's take the questions from the um, um, committee first, and then we can call upon okay. Tracy. How's about that? Okay. Um, Anna. I thought you were going to call in Tracy, so I took a bite. Um, oh, question? Sorry. No, it's fine. Uh, what's going to prevent this from just squeezing out onto every other road right nearby it? What I'm saying is there's, there seems to be parking restrictions on a lot of the streets already. Not a, I mean, there aren't that many streets here. Do we, so have, we, do we have information on what those parking restrictions are and how far out they go from, yes, we from do. Lincoln? Do you know, can you tell me, I guess is my question. I know we have it. I just don't, I don't know it. And so I'm curious what, because what I don't want to have happen is, you know, we, we do this for Lincoln and then they all move one, one or two streets over and then we have to do it for those streets, right? And like, we just keep squeezing. I'd rather figure out what the actual problem is and how to solve it versus just, I'm not saying this isn't a problem, but I'd rather also address the underlying issue that is, you know, why folks are are parking here so that we're not just moving the problem to right. a different street. So this is a very tiny neighborhood. There's basically, so I was lucky when I was campaigning. I mean, I could walk it like several times in one day. So it's very compact. So it's not like there's that many streets for it to spill over. So there's Lincoln. Um, Fearing already, I believe, and correct me, has no parking on one side of the street because that's a major through street. Then there's um, Cosby. Uh, Page, McClellan, Beston are teeny streets. So they, there is like on Cosby, there is already no parking. Uh, there's no parking ever on one side and another side. I think it's not from like eight to three on weekdays because you literally, if a car was parked, you could not get down the street. So the only, I mean, from what I can see, the only street there might be a spillover is Sunset. The other streets have restrictions and they're just teeny little streets. And the you know houses really close together, but in fact the so, residential parking permits, which I didn't realize we had, but we have a small number of residential parking permits for people who live on Page and Beston, and we, the town council, included Page in that group, allows people who live on those streets because there is no, no parking on the street because they're so narrow, to buy a town permit for twenty five dollars, and to park um, on those street. I think on on um, Cosby. Uh, and the only and street that I could see having a, any spillover would be Sunset. There's only one street. You don't so, think it'll go down to Dana or Blue Hills? No, no. no. There's somehow Amity is, nobody parks on the other side of Amity. And so right. you, can't, you can't cross Amity. So that's you know, the pedestrian crossings. There's almost no pedestrians crossing. Kind of brave enough. Uh, can I, so, so, but Jennifer, what you're saying, sorry, I'm wrapping this up, yeah. is that Sunset does not currently have the same restrictions that are being proposed for Lincoln. No, and they don't have cars parked on it. They, they haven't had like, If we put these restrictions for Lincoln, but not for Sunset, would we be squishing everybody over to Sunset? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Um, okay. okay. That's the only street where that could happen. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna call on Andy. But I have a yeah, comment I've... I wanna make after Andy. Several things now is that I've thought about and was looking at as we were talking, uh, but uh, to the last TSO, we did talk about Lincoln and um, Sunset as being parallel streets. 
in the uncertainty about sunset. And we recognized that in the adoption of the proposal for Lincoln that we could be looking at sunset very quickly. The question came up about why is there a problem? And I think that the problem probably exists for two reasons. One is the lack of adequate parking on campus. We know that some lots were sold out, but uh, probably the larger is the cost of parking and people who are trying to uh, avoid paying the cost of the parking charges for um, on-campus parking. Uh, we have uh, only anecdotal evidence. We have no real hard evidence that that's the cause, but I think it's, let's say, a reasonable assumption to make. Um, but the last thing that I think is uh, where I'm going to leave my suggestion for today is that there were actually two different things that were developed by the last in the last TSO. One was um, public way review process, and the other was the uh, TSO review criteria. And uh, the uh, one I was able to find of the criteria was labeled as a draft from September 23, 21. I need to see if I can find that there was a final adopted or if we were ever forever operating off of the draft. Um, but if, uh, but I can also ask some other former members of the committee if they have a recollection on either of those points. Okay. As far as the um, first of those two items that I was referring to, which is the public way review process, it was essentially saying request for parking changes or other public way requests should be sent to the town council president. Uh, the president can automatically refer the request to TSO uh, with notification to the council or may choose to bring the request to the town council for discussion and a formal referral vote. So that was left as a, uh, for the president to make that determination. Um, and then, uh, said indicated proposals can come from and there were four bullets town staff town committee town councilor or resident request if there's a town council responsibility so i imagine that if they um, you would apply those bullets because the was adopted as a policy and it could be either considered a town councilor request or a resident request um, with the town council sponsor but i think Either way, Jennifer's mm -hmm. making that request or forwarding their, the request. And then there was uh, the um, questions about um, how to proceed deliberation. And the deliberation says uh, that uh, identification of stakeholders and soliciting comments. And it says after soliciting comments, for example, TAC, which we just mentioned, DAAC, which is the Disability Access Advisory Committee, the Public Shade Tree Committee, et cetera, uh, because it was left open as to whether any might be added by a TSO as it was considering the process. The next step was a public hearing and then final TSO review and vote and um, a council um, vote. And so, in the and it left that the council could refer it back for further review um, as one of its options. And when you get to the um, review criteria, um, that was the, what I said is was the only one I, that I could find quickly as I was looking through is labeled as draft, um, okay. but it is the one that has all of the criteria that I was describing earlier, um, looking at roadway classification, available pavement width, traffic flow data, avail um, and then the application of guidelines for application of criteria and additional considerations for collector and local roadways. Okay. And um, which is where I think that we are here. And I'll just read a couple of bullets to give you a sense of them. I'm not going to read them all. 
closeness to downtown or village centers, accident history, public safety, for example, sufficient access for school buses, hammers fire department trucks, parking demand, and it goes on from there. So uh, my suggestion uh, to the committee, though it's obviously I'm only one member, is to get those two documents and what the current uh, versions are to the committee for the next meeting and then pick up on the discussion from there. Uh, thank you, Andy. That, that sounds very good. I'm going to make my brief comment then call on Paul. And that is that the new dorm that, the, that UMass is building is on a parking lot. So they know what they're doing. They've had, they have lots of time. And obviously it is up to the university to find a way to provide more parking for its students. Um, and I, I trust that they will, okay? Uh, the other comment is about sunset. I've been, because of the closure of the top of Lincoln, I've been, and also I drive around my district, but I've been coming back and you can't go um, south on Lincoln from Mass Ave now. You have to go to sunset. And it's just not a really easy or friendly uh, entrance from sunset. It, there's a little divide and you're not quite sure which lane you're supposed to go in. It's just not that main road. Uh, Lincoln is the straight shot to the university, takes you right to the center, and um, which is why it's you know called a collector road. So the end of my comments, I'm gonna call on Paul now. Thank you, Dorothy. So the question I had, and this is was for the prior council's recommendation as well, was the problem that was identified was the proximity of people parking to driveways, making it hard to get out, the danger of having attempting to have two lanes and a parking when that is just not impossible and, and proven by the truck, the bus driver, the uh, inability of emergency vehicles to get in. And the solution that the council recommended was to fix that during certain hours, but not all the time. And so it seemed like that what, what then the complaint, the, the, the the concern was those are those are concerns, but then we're, we don't want students doing that. But if other people did it, it was okay because it was addressed. So I, I let me just finish. Okay. So so I, and I think that so I didn't understand why someone parking close to a driveway at five thirty was okay, but at five o'clock it wasn't okay. And so I, I was just I, 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 I mean I think what what Councillor Ross said in his the highlighted thing was just make it no parking period because that will be safer. And that's that's what that's what the solution is. So that was just when I read that last time with the council, it just mm. confused me why there were the, the time when it was okay at some point, but not okay at other points. Okay, uh, Paul, I, I didn't I totally understand what you said because the parking too close to the driveway happens during peak parking times when people are desperate to find a parking spot. Um, the parking too close to the driveways does not seem to be a problem after five. Mm -hmm. It's not who does it. It's that the time of day seemed to have something to do with whether everybody was jamming and trying competing for those few parking but, spots. But what about the width of the road where it was like two, it was 20. I, I it's not that, like if you come down in the summer, there's not too many cars parked, you know, but it's just an occasional guest, I guess, of somebody in the house, but right. it, it's, it it's is literally been, during the school year. There's but, not a Christmas right. vacation. I don't want to have this be a dialogue back and forth, but but you did say people called when people parked overnight when no one was parked on the street, and that was that was concern for for residents. So, as, as, I mean, as Dorothy said, I mean, yes, I guess it could happen, and it has, and they've called. They've actually called for it to be towed. If somebody, like sometimes a couple times, people have parked overnight on the west side of the street where you could never park, and they'll call. But if like if you were coming to visit someone. On Lincoln, you wouldn't have to park if there's not a lot of cars parked there. You wouldn't have to park right up to the curb. Now, I don't know when the new dorms are built. I mean, we might well find it's if not all year round. Although one of them is a graduate dorm, and graduate students may be here year round. Um, but I would, I wonder if on weekends we're going to have the same situation, you know, with people's guests because there's going to be you know like 600 undergraduates. Um, but that's what we found that there's. It's not an issue when there's not a lot of people competing for parking. And it only seems to be during, so thus far has been weekdays during the academic year. Right. Um, 
Paul, your hand is still up. Do you want to say something more? Okay. Um, and Anna. Yeah, I, I, I do want to echo what Paul was saying. If this is a matter of public safety, which it sounds like it is, then we should make sure that the public is safe at all hours of the day, um, mm -hmm. not just during daytime hours, and, and make sure that people can't park right up next to driveways because it limits ambulances, right? I, I think that it, if, if there are parking restrictions for public safety reasons, then I think they should apply at all hours um, because people don't only have medical emergencies and happen to have a car in front of their driveway at you know 3 p.m. Um, despite if that would be convenient. So so my my thought would just be I don't like the idea of limiting it even if that's the even if that's the the those are the perceived hours that there's an issue mm -hmm. because it only takes one time for it to be off hours and not be during you know and I'd rather not run that risk. I'd rather have it be that the 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 ambulance can get down that road and turn around whenever. Um, and then the other thing is, Andy, I appreciated your um, your request to bring those materials to our next meeting. I'd also love, and I guess I'm looking to Guilford because I know Tracy is stuck in the audience right now, but uh, I'd love if um, Tat could review this prior to our next meeting, um, if that's possible. I don't know when their next meeting is. And I also know that there's we're not sure if we're still figuring out all of the roles and the charges for um, for some of our committees, but if that's possible, that would be that'd be great just to get there, whether or not they come down on one side or another, but they can mm -hmm. give us some things to think about. Okay, so so and I do need some clarification. You're saying that you think there should be no parking at any time on the I east side of the road. I whatever we decide the parking limitation is I don't think it should be our specific because I think that from what I'm hearing the primary reason to put these parking restrictions into place is public safety for the folks living mm -hmm. on Lincoln and I don't think that we should limit public safety emergencies to daytime hours but but Anna I will I will, I will point out something to you okay. when there isn't when it isn't packed all the way parking when the university is in session then the driveway issue is not quite the the same. I mean, there's nothing totally different about driveways on Lincoln than driveways on other streets. What was different was that too many people were trying to park in limited space. And with the request to have driveway lines painted and 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 enforced is not something the town does. I mean, but there's nothing that's been brought up a number of times. So I, I would love to hear Guilford on this point, um, uh, because I, I do see you're saying if it's a problem that, that you can't get in, get into your driveway, and it is it has certainly has been a problem. Does that problem go away at five o'clock at night? That's your question. And it does. I mean, it's there's not a question though, Dorothy. It's not a question because there's nothing stopping it from going away, right? Like there's nothing that stops them from going right up to the driveway line and just thinking that that's a parking spot, even if they're the only car on the road. But they don't. I mean, I don't think we should come up with relying on but that. How is that different from other streets? Yeah, I mean. there's plenty of other streets that have. I mean, we just have parking at yeah. Kendrick Place that they have restrictions. I mean, that's like, it seems like it's it's punishing. I mean, why would we want to say nobody can ever park here when it's only a problem during, it seems like you're being, like, it's why not, would we do something for which there's no reason? Or there might be, or there might not be. We don't know. No, but so, there's not. I mean, if one car is parked on the street, it's not. If it's not parked in front of a driveway. Right, which it doesn't. I mean, would you park? I mean, people are the reason they're over they're right up to the driveway is because all these cars are trying to squeeze in. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is there, there's certain, you know, it, there's and it only happens. I mean, I guess we did not want, I, or we the residents who live, they do not want to say nobody can ever park on Lincoln. That seems that seems very restrictive, but there's. It be, and they would actually be okay if you said maybe two hour parking. So, you know, there wasn't just people, well, I mean, they would be happy if you could just park, you know, you could just mark the curbs. But I think it's, mm -hmm. at some point, it's just like bringing, you know, a sledgehammer to, you know, a thumbtack. Okay. <laughs> let, let me call on some more people here. Okay. Um, Anika, your hand was up. You still want to talk? Yeah, I um I I agree with um what has been said. I but didn't the report also say that a lot of these folks that are parking during the day are staying overnight? 
there are cars that stay overnight. And when people, I would say most cars don't, but when they do, I think the, the residents were, could, didn't think that you could do that. And um, so it, it's the, the, I think there needs to be some level of parking management. And there is something between saying, you can park on the street 365 okay. days a year, 24 seven, and you can never park on the street. I mean, we should be able to come up with something that makes is more, I think, common sense mm -hmm. than one extreme or the other. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I see what you're saying, too, but we're getting cut between like inconvenience and safety, you know? Okay. And I think that if it's about, I agree that if it's about safety, that's blanket, whereas um, if you're saying, okay, just in the evenings, people can, you know, park then, and if that would um, decrease a lot of the people coming for university, but still, I mean, it is still a street that is um, close to town and, you know, the same issues could happen with um, guests parking, mm -hmm. going to, you know, visit people at night and, uh, and coming up to the driveways. I mean, it may happen, but we, it's, you know, it's not a street where there's a lot of people parked. I mean, there's usually not cars parked on the street at night. So it's not, so that's how we came up with those hours because those are the hours in which it's congested to park. And that's also the hours like when a school bus and people are commuting back and forth. I mean, it, we may find that when the dorms open, it does become a problem more, you know, I still don't know that it's a problem in the summer. Like, well, I'm going to call Andy, but just remember, and I think this may relate to what Anna was saying, there's a problem between two lanes of traffic and a lane of parking. Um, that is a problem. Um, Andy. Yeah, I mean, I've, um, there's the answers to some of these questions, probably my recollection, and I can't remember if this came from select board days or council days, because I've yeah. been dealing with Lincoln Avenue for too many years in both in sequential positions. Um, but there was a, a concern and, and a desire expressed by some residents of Lincoln um, who spoke at one point that they would like to have the ability to have guests come to their house at night for entertainment, dinner party, whatever. And so the um, total restriction of parking um, was not necessarily something they favored because they wanted the flexibility to be able to do that to be a host in their in their in in their home and not uh, make it impossible for people to actually visit. Um, and there's but, not a lot but, of traffic at those hours, and again, maybe we'll find that's different. When yeah, maybe we'll find it's different, which sort of gets to my. But the major point is, I I, I mentioned in, when I spoke in the previous time about the two policies that exist and so that we had a that under the existing policy that the request should go to the president who makes a determination i don't know if she has or not uh, you guys have to tell me as to whether she's made a formal referral to tso or or not but that's something that uh, was left to the president but um equal importance we're jumping way ahead of the process even if she had made a referral because we haven't sought input from other committees we haven't had a, um, a public hearing which we would be required to have and we haven't spent the time looking at the criteria some of which were originally provided by guilford in classification of the streets and uh what is needed in the width, depending upon the classification of the streets, as far as um, how wide each section needs to be for two-way parking, for uh, two-way traffic parking, and uh, what what's required for um, the very the three classifications that exist, and uh, that's part of the criteria that we have to look at. So I think that by jumping to the conversation at the stage we have, we're way, way ahead of ourselves on the process. Lynn has a hand up. Uh, yes, oh, thank you. Uh, I, I, yes, very much. Lynn, would you please uh, be admitted to, Athena, admit Lynn to the meeting, please? 
I'm only here to clarify because otherwise you have a quorum of the council. I am going to ask Athena, but I believe the council voted to refer this to TSO, which should be sufficient. That's correct. Okay. Please exit me. Okay. Okay. So there had been discussion uh, with Lynn, and I could probably get things wrong here, that um, in her view, this had been studied. Um, we had excerpt, ex very detailed reports from DPW, and that uh, it seemed that what we needed to do was to have a public hearing and actually without spending a tremendous amount of time um, pass this request. Um, if that's not gonna be, it's not gonna be, but that was um, the information that was passed on to me that it seemed that it's something that could be done easily. And, um, you know, that is, I guess, my hope. Um, Shalini, I see your hand is up. Yeah, and so public hearing, and then we need to send it to TAC. And should we uh, yes. allow so, Tracy to come in? So she absolutely, thank comment. you so much for keeping that on. I'm gonna let Paul speak first, just in case it's relevant to this, unless you wanna wait until after Tracy speaks. This is just a clarification, this is, um, how do you change? Because the question is, how do we change this the, the regulation? And Athena has already done this. I'm just going to read it, Athena, because you wrote it. Um, the general bylaw 3.14 requires that there be a public hearing. TSO is authorized to, by the council to hold the public hearing. Um, so the hearing must be posted. On, the notice of the hearing must be posted on the town bulletin board for at least 14 days, and published in a newspaper for two weeks prior to the hearing and notica notification of the hearing be sent to a butters 14 days prior to the hearing. Uh, any notice of the hearing would include the spe specific changes that the council is considering. Um, so, I mean, so I there'd have to be a specific proposal that I think, you know, Councillor Tom has said, I'd like it to be this, whatever Councillor Tom okay. says is gonna be my recommendation. I think it would be the, the proposal. Um, and, it, and it's best to include whatever the proposal is in the notification. So everybody who gets the notification knows what's right. being contemplated. Uh, the bylaw also requires that all reasonable and practicable attempts shall be made to notify businesses and residential tenants of immediately affected or abutting properties. Uh, given the university is named in the memo and students are identified as well, it could be problematic to hold a hearing outside of the school term. At a minimum, the university should be sent notice of the public hearing. Uh, so, and I, but you can initiate, begin this process certainly tonight or, or send it to TAC to get, get their recommendation back and then initiate the process. Right. So different options available. Okay. I, and I thank Athena for putting that all together. Right. That, that was really useful. And so you're saying that tonight, what we have to really deal with today is um, we haven't, we can, we will have a vote on whether to send this to TAC. Um, but first, let me uh, call Tracy to speak on this topic. And I see the name. Uh, I don't hear a voice. Sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we do. OK, great. Sorry, I was just interrupted at my door. Um, uh, OK, there were a few things. So one is um, the question had come up about why TAC hasn't provided feedback on these changes. And I think really, I mean, I and you know, this has come up before about what's tax role and how do items come to TAC. I think that's still in progress. Um, the town manager and I have met on that. We're going to meet again, and there, he's in the process uh, with some feedback of drafting an updated track chart. Um, so, I mean, the TAC has commented previously on Lincoln parking. Um, when the proposal, the previous proposal that was introduced by councilors Ryan and Pam came to um, came to TSO and the council, I mean, we did provide, there were TAC members, including the chair at the time, um, Aaron Hayden, who came and came to TAC meetings and provided their feedback. Um, a former member, Eve Vogel, also provided feedback. I know I wasn't on the TAC then and I made comments as well. Um, a lot of our comments were focused on safety at that time, particularly the safety about sight lines if, um, mm -hmm. if you know, at the driveways and also at some of the intersections 
um, if you can't see very well. I mean, to me as like a driving safety person, like that's always a big concern and that's where you have a lot of crashes. That's where kids get hit. That's where pedestrians get hit and so on. So that's always a risky area. Um, so, so basically, I mean, um, Andy Steinberg had just mentioned about the procedure that TSO developed for assessing public way requests, including parking. And, um, and that procedure that was developed by TSO was used the last time the Lincoln parking um, proposal for changing the parking was considered. Um, and TAC had weighed in on that as well. Um, and we provided mm -hmm. some feedback in the draft versions. And it seemed like that process worked well. Um, so I mean, we're just, you know, sort of in that pattern. So, I mean, I think TAC could, I'm actually right now, we TAC is scheduled to have a meeting next week and I'm working on the agenda. I mean, if you want, if TSO would like this to be on our agenda, we can put it on our agenda. I need to get it to Amber tomorrow. Um, okay. And I mean, I mean, just a few comments, you know, too, I think the question, there was a question raised about I mean, just from my own perspective about the public safety, you know, if if it's an if it's a danger um, during sometimes, like why isn't is it not a danger all the time to have parking on the street? Mm -hmm. I think that one one big case with Lincoln, as opposed to say someplace like Kendrick Place, Kendrick Place is just such a narrow road, so it's never going to be really appropriate to have a lot of parking there on both sides of the street. Um, and and there, I mean, we are still allowing parking on one side of the street, right? So this current proposal would restrict parking on Lincoln on both sides of the street for certain periods of time. Those are the periods of time that do have the highest traffic volumes related to UMass. You know, they are weekday traffic. Um, you know, particularly, we don't see it as much now when one Lincoln is closed off, but also because it's summer. But when you do have like high traffic roadways, particularly for those busy times of day, those commuting patterns, which Lincoln has always been a major commuting road, even with the speed bumps, I mean, the speed tables. And I mean, actually, one thing I really like is the idea of, you know, now that those are there and they're on Blue Hills Road as well, that people do use those streets to cut less, cut through less. Mm -hmm. And so maybe, you know, if Lincoln was ever closed, as was previously proposed and some people have talked about it again if it was ever closed at fearing it really would take drivers who are going over to UMass or coming from UMass out of the neighborhoods like and onto the major streets like University Drive and North Pleasant Street and things like that that are more designed to have three traffic um, so to me when when there are times of day that have much I mean it's just like other major roadways you know if you look at I can't think of examples right around Amherst but you know, like state highways that go through busy business areas and things like sometimes a day they say no parking, right? Because they know they want all the lanes of traffic and things. And then when it's less busy, you allow parking. So I see it like that. So, I mean, I think, you know, it is an issue about, like if you look at the map, as um, Jennifer was saying, I mean, most of the parking in the area is restricted. The fact that Lincoln is one of the few streets that doesn't have any kind of restriction right now in that section. Um, South McClellan is, is one of the reasons I think that people are parking there. Um, but if you look at that map, you can see that most of the map is red or it has like permanent parking things and Sunset is the one exception. I mean, Sean Mangano has brought up a number of times, you know, in talking about the new parking rates, about how you know, that people will find the places where they can still park and not pay. Like people will find the loopholes and like, what are the loopholes and can we cut out the loopholes? I mean, I know for me, just anecdotally, I work at UMass. I work right off of Commonwealth Avenue. A lot of my colleagues um, were parking in some of those parking lots, including where the new dorms are being built and they can't park there anymore. They have to park further away. They also don't wanna pay those high parking permit costs at UMass, particularly because we also have offices off site. So like some of them spend half their time not at UMass Amherst and at UMass Amherst, so they don't want to be paying. And the parking tickets are pretty big mm -hmm. and they've been like piling up. And I mean, I do think, I mean, even I occasionally have parked in the neighborhoods because it's pretty close to high no shot, but it's pretty close. And, um, and now it's summer and things and I don't want to pay it either. I mean, so. I end up parking in the hourly parking and 
a lot of students park in the hourly parking too and it pushes there's not enough spaces for the hourly it's interesting because our, all the hourly spaces at umass will be full and the hourly parking is pretty expensive i think it's up to like 250 an hour or something like a quarter every 10 minutes so if you're working there a whole day that's like quite a chunk of change oh, yeah um and uh but they prefer that instead of having those permits so you'll see that the parking the permitted lots aren't even full and the and the metered spaces are all full so mm. hey interesting that's sure that's it thanks okay um andy got your hand up thank you Tracy. Well, if i uh, may share screen maybe it's worth looking at the policy quickly on the procedure yes it's uh, so that we just can apply it and get moving i don't think i think we're making this more complicated than it needs to be mm -hmm. so i think that i can uh, do this uh, fairly quickly uh, let's see if this one works okay so uh, this is the uh tso public uh, you, you see what it is it's the review process and we've already talked about town council referral uh lynn came in and clarified that for us so we're moving on to number two tso decision to proceed once referred tso decides how it wants to proceed um they decide not to take up the request which i don't think we've decided um but uh it um moves forward from there TSO deliberation, and this is where we have the opportunity to seek stakeholder input and um, so you see um, solicit comments from TAC. We just had it informally. We could do more formally disability access advisory, public entry, or any other committee that we deem to be relevant for the discussion. Uh, and uh, I see that there was a uh, spelling error here in stakeholders, but uh, what uh, we get to is that um, at um, the appropriate point, we move to the public hearing stage. Uh, and uh, so I think that's why I think that we just need to figure out where we are with the process and then uh, just, um, keep it moving because I think it provides guidance on how to proceed with this request and it just would be a way to move forward. I can go back a little more slowly if people like. Okay, so I know that when we spoke to Lynn earlier, she was trying to move towards a public hearing this summer. Um, and, but looking at this process, um, we have to do number two. We have to decide to proceed, how we're going to do it. Um, and we can certainly solicit, um, formally solicit from TAC and DAAC. Um, we could, so theoretically, if we agreed, we could have at our next given the two weeks, you know, if we have the two weeks and all the note time to do the notification of the abutters, our, our next meeting could be a public hearing and deliberation and getting some more input. We do the public hearing and then get formal input from TAC and DAAC and, um, you know, the stakeholders and the abutters would have been notified and we can then proceed to um, vote on this. Um, but the question is, are we ready to do that? Um, Lynn's hands up again. Oh, thank you. That's really helpful because I don't see that at all. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lynn, please, I'd love to hear from you. I, I believe that Paul and Athena and then Paul have made a very good point, which I did not consider in my time frame, And that is that this probably should be done when the university is in session. Mm -hmm. And okay. that, so that would move our time frame to the earliest being September. Okay. okay. Thank you. Throw me out again. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I wasn't quite sure how formally we took that, but uh, let's uh, listen. We spent a lot of time on this. I hope that we do it and do it right. Okay. And then we can then move on to other things. Um, uh, Andy, comment. 
No, I, I should take my hand down. I should quit uh, sharing too, if uh, people are ready for me to do that. I think that the question that Athena raised before is a um, question of whether you need to do something in having a proposal to take for public hearing as opposed to just a general, uh, what do you think? And uh, that's a decision that requires application of the public hearing policy also in mixing that in with this. Um, so I think that has to be considered as we make the determination of when to have the public hearing. But also we have the point that Linda's raised about not doing it when the university's uh, not in session. Okay, just before I call Paul, I am confused. I thought that we were, the, what the proposal was to represent the proposal that DPW had given us, which as Guilford said, would include two parts which have already been done, but he wanted to have a complete redone parking thing so that we don't have to spend time creating a new proposal, that we have that proposal, which was done by the experts. Okay, Paul, calling on you. Yeah, I agree. I think that's, I think uh, Councilor Tom has said, I would like the council to reconsider the proposal, not reconsider, but we want to look at the exact same proposal right. again. And so that's the proposal that's on the table. I think the other action you can take tonight is to ask the TAC, if you would like the TAC to comment on it, have them say, here's the proposal, can you look at this? So you can get some things moving, right? Um, right, right, okay. And TAC already has a meeting scheduled. It's tracing and throw that on the agenda tomorrow. They can start to move that quickly. Yes. Um, I think then your decision is, should we have a hearing during the summer or should we wait till the university is back in session? That's a decision you can make. Okay, that's very good. Okay, so um, three thoughts then. Um, one, stick with the proposal that we have. Two, uh, formally say, Tracy, this is a proposal and um, I believe Andy, you can send over the, send to Tracy for TAC, the, our process, whether we finalized it or not, I thought it was finalized when it was used by TSO. And I think it is a good process. It's very thorough. Um, and to ask TAC to give a formal uh, request. And what was the third one? Ah, and the question was, Lynn came down, Lynn had wanted to, to do this before the university's in session. I think the more conservative point of view is to say, okay, since the university is in the butter, they have to be notified. Let's wait till the university is back in session so that when we do this thing, we, we do it with all the I's dotted and we can <clears throat> move forward from it. Um, so that is my recommendation called from what people have said in this meeting. Are there any comments on this? Shalini. Do we need to make a formal vote to send it to TAC or is it already decided? I think um, what we said, one, that we're going to represent the motion that was presented before, two, that we're going to look at the process that TSO developed in the past, whether it was finalized, finalized, I, we don't know, but it's really pretty much finished copy, um, that we would um, send that proposal to TAC and formally say, TAC, we'd like to have your opinion, um, that we have a public hearing, but that we wait to have set that public hearing um, mm -hmm. for when the university is in session and that that's how we move forward. Uh, now, do we want to vote on that? Um, we can, or we can have an understanding if nobody disagrees with it. I mean, you know, Quaker sense of the meeting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I'm just, I'm saying I'm good with that. If you don't need the motion, then yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then we're agreed on how to move forward. Um, and, um, since Guilford has been forced to hang out here this whole time, um, I'd love to hear a comment from you because a lot of questions and comments have been raised about why prohibit parking in the daytime and not all the time. And uh, I just would be interested in any thoughts that you've had when you've heard us struggling with this issue. Um, that's an interesting question. <laughs> well, well, if if to, to, to look at every street the same way, we go back to our memo we sent earlier, which said we should look at the classification, the use of the road, and the widths of the road. Based on that, we would recommend no parking 
on Lincoln at all, either side, no parking, 24 hours a day. Okay. Um, we, under, we understand that doesn't meet every resident's needs and that there might be places in town where you could allow it, but Lincoln is a well-traveled road. Mm -hmm. And if the campus does reopen it at their end, when the construction is done, it will remain a well-traveled road. Um, and as you, you have travel and you also have people who park there because it is one of the, the last, free, last free things in America, free parking, everybody loves free parking. Um, so uh, we, we would go with our original suggestion is that those criteria should be applied and even to Lincoln and we would say no parking whatsoever. Then we would have to, if we were gonna do that, we would have to reword the proposal, right? You would, but uh, you know, we under, I understand that there's other considerations that go into it if you want to and make certain considerations. But then if you make those considerations on Lincoln, when you go to another neighborhood, you're going to have to make considerations for those neighborhoods too. So, are you willing to are you willing to do that for Lincoln, mm -hmm. and then do it in other places? And that's okay. So that's that is an interesting question. Okay, so this is the first time I've heard you state this this clearly, Guilford. And I, I have to say that when it comes to things like parking and safety on the roads, I'm going to really listen to what you have to say as being very, very important. So um, I will call on Paul and then on Jennifer. Yeah, so maybe a path forward. You're going to send it to, you've already said, agreed that you're going to send it to TAC. Mm -hmm. When they get back their recommendations, you can hear BPW's recommendations. You have the counselor's proposal. And then I think as a committee, you say, what do we want to advertise? What do we want to put out there is what we're going to okay. recommend. And then you all agree, this committee agrees what it wants to advertise. And it can be no parking either side. It can be the existing proposal. It can be some, mm -hmm. something in between. Okay. But you guys, it's not like you made a decision, but you need to post what you're going to talk right, about, right. what you think. And then you want to listen to public comment. And then you mm -hmm. make your recommendation to the whole town council. So I think, okay. you know, I think moving this forward and then holding off on what your judgment is until your mm -hmm. next meeting of the meeting after that might be the best path forward. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. I hope I can remember it. Um, but in other words, whatever we understood or not, we're just formally asking tax opinion. Um, DPW, you can send us whatever you want again. Then we're gonna have, uh, we will advertise, we will meet and talk before we post for the, for the public hearing. So we don't have to make, we don't know right at this moment exactly what those words will be because we're waiting for the formal input uh, again. And then we get the input from the public and then we talk and decide, okay, this is what we're gonna to propose to the town council. So, okay, I got that. Jennifer. Um, yes, so I do have a question of uh, Guilford. If there is no place else in town where there's only parking restrictions during certain hours? No. So um, if I have, my face starts twitching is because I'm having flashbacks to the 2000s. Um, we went through this during the 2000s and there was these restrictions were, some of these restrictions about hourly parking were um, in place before that. Others were put in place around the 2002, 2003. Um, there are parking time limit restrictions on several roads in town. Um, they're predominantly near the campus. Um, and then um, there is the permit parking. And a lot of this all came about because people were concerned about parking and traffic on their street and being able to enter and exit their driveways. And that's how, that's how the residential parking permit system came about. And that basically, that basically was the fact that the need was to have parking 24 hours a day in front of the house, except overnight in the winter at that time. Um, and then there's a couple of streets that have different um, hourly parkings. There's probably three or four, I think, that have hourly parkings throughout town. So, because um, so where I live on Lincoln, there's no parking uh, eight to five uh, weekdays during the academic year. 
Um, and occasionally there will be cars, not in those hours parked on the street and it's not a problem. I mean, there's rarely, but it, I mean, there are sometimes cars like will park on a Saturday night or Sunday morning or whatever for, um, and it's, it's never been a problem. So I just, and I've lived in many cities and towns and different places. And I, there's always streets where you can park sometimes and you can't park others. So I just don't see why that, how that possibly um, is an issue that you have to say all or, or nothing. That doesn't, um, and it's working on the portions of the street and the other streets that they all have different hours and days you can park. They have different parking restrictions from Cosby to McClellan to Beston to Page to certain parts of Lincoln. And it, the, you know, it seems to be working. I mean, the only people, you know, that the concerns, and again, I haven't had any concerns from Sunset is mm -hmm. on the part of Lincoln where there's bumper to bumper traffic all, all day. That's the only, and I don't know why we have to fix other, you know, what's not broken. That I'm confused about that. So, so I, Gopher's got his hand up. And um, so you would say that you did all kinds of different things in the 2000s. And some of them were ones which had hours when you couldn't park and others you just couldn't park at all. Uh, do you have any gleanings from that process? I mean, did you say after you did it, oh my God, I wish we hadn't done that. It didn't solve the problem. Parking is a, I've been here 20 years and parking has been an issue um, routinely throughout the 20 years. It's moved around town. Um, the place that it actually, it, the place that actually amazes me the most is around the high school. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of an interesting thing that we'll never be able to solve because when you start the school year, you have a bunch of students who are under 16 and a half. And as the school year goes along, they be, they be they age and get their driver's permit. And then as the year goes along, the parking problems in the neighborhood goes up until graduation time where the parking problem people are complaining the most, um, which has been interesting to watch that. Um, there have been, that, that has actually been a little less in the last few years, but that was something that's just a cyclic thing that the high school has a population that ages and then starts driving and then starts parking on the side streets. Um, you have issues in other parts of town, which have been interesting, where it's just areas that become more student rental areas. We've seen parking change in those areas. It's more a fact that a little a few houses will turn into rentals and they'll tell their friends, hey, you know, there's parking, there's free parking on our street. And then you'll see parking pick up on those streets and then people start complaining about parking on those streets. So parking is always going to be moving. Mm -hmm. Parking is always going to be dynamic. And there's gonna be the residents who own the house who want to be able to do the park in front of their house when they wanna park in front of their house. And there's gonna be people coming to town who always wanna have a place to park and find the cheapest place to park. Um, that's always gonna happen. Um, the only difference on Lincoln from many other streets, like Cosby is the only street that's close to Lincoln that has a time limit on it that I know of. And it has a time limit from eight to three. Why eight to three? That was just chosen at the time it was chosen. You know, Lincoln's eight to five. Um, so, and it's got a lot less traffic on it. Um, Lincoln has a lot more traffic on it and it's a lot more of a through road has been a lot more through it in the past. So you have a lot more conflicts between drivers and cyclists and parked cars. Um, it's, if you look at the crash data, um, the majority of the crashes on Lincoln are with parked cars. So is it two cars trying to pass each other and one car doesn't make it and hits the parked car on the side of the road? Um, what, what is the, we don't really know what that dynamic is. Mm -hmm. um, so it's so that's parking in Amherst. Um, it's, uh... um, Jennifer, can I say something before? Sure. Calling? Okay. Sure. You just prompted me um, when we first started talking about this. A resident of Lincoln said, "Listen, I want to bring back that Lincoln was a bikeway." And um, so this is a chance for me to bring this up. If in fact we did 
as you said, no parking. Okay, on Lincoln. Would you be able to do something more formal in terms of a bikeway? Because, you know, I do think that there would be people using it to commute to the university and it would be part of a, um, our general urge to do safe bikeways. We could look into doing something um, for that. Um, when Lincoln was a was a bikeway, it was back before it was it was done back before two thousand. Um, it was done with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. They were going through and designating certain roads that connected that weren't weren't um, numbered routes in town, but had direct access to places as a bikeway for people to use it for biking. And it was basically a share, share of the road type biking system. It wasn't build off-road facilities or separate facilities, it was share of the road. And mm -hmm. that's how Lincoln was designated um, and kind of how it came about. Did it get undesignated? Um, it, it's not marked that, it's not marked, not marked that way anymore because we've kind of moved away from that. And um, it's, um, it, it still shows up on the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission maps for bikeways. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, Jennifer. Yeah, two things. I just want to reiterate again, as Guilford said, Lincoln is a throughway during commuter hours. I mean, there's also, there's people that park here and there's people that just drive here to get to campus. Um, I know people that work on, you know, faculty that this is the street that they use. So we don't need, there are definite hours when Lincoln cannot accommodate traffic and parking and it's not, you know, Sunday night. So to say, you could, I feel like there's a little bit of, okay, you don't want parking. Well, now we're really going to give you no parking, but we really want parking management. And, mm -hmm. you know, I know of a neighborhood, I think it's in district one, it's on North Pleasant street, just the neighborhood North of the campus. And they were having a lot of, it was students parking there at night. And I think they were for parties. And then they were having people that were just letting their friends park there. So I know in this particular neighborhood, there's parking allowed during the day, but not, I think, you know, maybe after 10 p.m. or something. I mean, they got very specific to deal with when there was an issue. And again, the issue on Lincoln is commuter traffic and parking during work days when the university is in session and not other times. And I would not, um, I, so I, I think we should be, we don't need to um, fix something that isn't broken or break, you know, break something that's not broken. I would just really, um, you know, not ask us to play. It's parking management. It's we're not looking to say you can never park on Lincoln Avenue. Thank you. Okay. So, do we have any other comments at this time? Um, can we wrap this for now and do the process that I outlined a while ago, which I've written down, but can't remember what it is anymore. I guess, seek formal um, input from TAC and Disability uh, Access Committee, um, use a proposal that Jennifer presented, understand that we will then meet and talk before we put the words together for the public hearing. And that public hearing will help be held after the university is in session. Um, is that okay with everybody? Okay. All right, so Guilford, we could release you unless you have some parting words you want. Uh, but I, I, I do appreciate your being here Thank today. You. I really do. I, I, it's very helpful because I know that you know the answers to these problems. Um, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. And now we're, Shalini is prepared to change our mind. It's of course related, of course, it has to do with public input, which that's who we are. We're the public face of the town committee. So Shalini, the meeting is yours. Um, how much time do we have? Because I was thinking that since we don't have much time, I could just do the first three slides to give you a sense of what I was thinking about it mm -hmm. and get some feedback from you, what you think is missing in the process. What it, so it's just a starting point mm -hmm. for us to start thinking about uh, how our council committees can think through these initiatives that we have um, in a way that we are we're uniformly across 
committees following a process where we're really understanding what is the problem we're solving for, who is it impacting, and what are some what is a systematic way we can reach out to the different stakeholders without being too burdensome on the town staff or us. But I think there's some avenues and channels we have that are currently not being utilized. And by systemizing it, we will be able to do that. So okay. given I've said I mean how many minutes do we have? Well, okay, it's quarter of, of nine. And I think we're supposed to close at nine. No, we're um, supposed to close at 8.30, Dorothy. Oh, thank you. Okay. So then, um, Anna, since you know that, do you think that we should go on to, to give Shalini the start um, to get us thinking? Um, I don't remember the date of the next meeting. So that would be nice if somebody knows the next TSO meeting. I believe our next meeting, I guess Athena can confirm. I just closed my calendar, sorry. Um, I don't think it's for another couple of weeks. I think, I I don't necessarily think it's right. super. I have fair. July 21. Yeah, I have it's a while. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I, well, I, I, if Shalini can give a quick overview and maybe then send us some stuff to review before the next meeting that, so that we can come prepared, if that's possible, that might be good to not keep everybody here too, too much longer. Okay. Wait, did everyone get the email I sent out though? That was with the I, slides I and that's the material basically yeah. is that the slide. So I can just run through the first three slides, I think explain mm -hmm. the process and that will, you'll have time to think through mm -hmm. and, you know, make suggestions. So I'm going to share my screen. Great. Um, one second. PowerPoint. Here we go. Share screen. All right, everyone can see that. Um, restart. All right. All right. Uh, so the objectives of having this discussion is that um, basically we want to create a process, like I said, to systematically plan and implement our community uh, engagement and outreach for our town council initiatives. And so the first thing for us to discuss is what are the steps in designing a community engagement plan? And I don't mean like we need to spend hours, but I think once we have the template down, it's very easy to walk through it uh, fairly quickly. The second thing is under each step, what are the key questions we need to ask and then identify, it'll be great for us to start building an inventory of community uh, partners and whatnot. Okay, so the step one, um, is what is the problem we're solving for? So can I give an example of the rental registration bylaw? Yeah, that'll be so, very nice. Yeah, so the CRC is working on that and we're actually using some of these steps now. So the, uh, the problem we're solving there is how, how to improve the quality and safety of housing in our town, right? And so once we articulate what is the problem we're solving for, then we think about uh, even do we even need to engage the community because not every decision or discussion we're having involves the community or impacts the committee greatly. So there are specific questions we can ask under that. Like, does this have environmental, economic, social justice, uh, any of those impacts? Are we, is it going to impact the taxes of the people? Like, you know, so those are the kind of questions you want to think through to see if we need to engage the community. And then the step three is, assuming we are engaging the community, what do we already know? What are the, because um, often we have consultants reports, we have like tax said they had provided the comments. And so, you know, seeing the committee comments, consultant reports, previous uh, engagement of the public, you know, what, because I know, for example, with the downtown, in, there were two great public forums that were held using very innovative ways to get people's feedback or what they want to see in downtown. And it's sort of lost. We never really think about it. And so, you know, those are the kind of things we want to gather at the outset before we start engaging and doing everything all over again. Then the fourth step is like, who is impacted by this issue and how? And so again, in rental registration, obviously, we have the renters and tenants um, and tenants could be uh, people of low income who are 
generally people we don't really reach out to or students that we don't often hear from, but it also impacts the residents and neighbors. Uh, so there is that group and then there's the landlords. But then besides that, we wanna hear from ECAC because we're talking about updoing, uh, updating our uh, residential bylaw. So what sort of inspections might include uh, energy efficiencies and what? So the committees, which committees do we wanna include in this process? Which town staff needs to, do we need to hear from? And, um, and then the last one is the step five is the actual engagement. So what, once we know uh, who we are talking to and what is the problem we're solving for, then what sort of questions do we need to ask as opposed to just open opinions? Do you think we should increase our rental registration fee or instead of asking um, blanket questions like that, it's uh, probably a good idea to have more targeted so like with rental registration we want to understand the lived experiences of tenants of neighbors of landlords what you know what are the difficulties they're encountering or what is what are they noticing that's working well for them that's not working well for them so kind of guiding the conversation in a way that is constructive and helping us design policies that are really helping people and so then i've taken each step and I've given recommend suggested questions like just some ideas for people to think through um, under each step but each committee can obviously depending on the topic they might come up with their own questions that are important to them <laughs> but I think the problem statement is a really important one I think that's one I was hearing right now on um, Lincoln Avenue, for example, is it a safety issue? Are we solving for safety or are we solving for convenience? Are we solving for, you know, what are we solving for over here? So that problem statement needs to, and everyone needs to be on the same page. Um, and who, who initiated, who sponsored it? Is it coming from town staff? Is it coming? So these are like just kind of questions that really help to understand the process. The second is, do we need to engage? And I think over here, like I already stated, some of the reasons uh, when there's an environmental, economic, racial, when there is an increase in taxes, or if, we are, if there are concerns already like Lincoln Avenue, like the neighbors who are concerned about it. So, you know, it is something we have to pay attention to. Uh, what do we know and not know? What research consultants? I think I already said all of this. Uh, who's impacted by this and who is hard to reach? Who are we already hearing from? And that's kind of, you know, what right. the pattern we see is that there are people we hear and that's great that there are residents mm -hmm. who are involved and we're so grateful to them. And at the same time, there's so many people who are impacted and who are not there. So how can we, even just having that intention, I feel, uh, really makes a difference. Like even in designing this thing, um, you know, just having that question, what would success, that was the last step, what would success look like? Even just asking that question made me include that question in the survey, we're gonna have a rental registration, how did you hear about the survey? You know, so um, I think just thinking about what questions to ask, what sort of demographic questions do we need to know, what channels of communication, what tools are available, what's the timeline, like, and I think the timeline, Mandy Chair has done a really good job with rental res registration. She's broken down the bylaw into specific pieces that what we're gonna be discussing each time and who we're gonna be calling at different points of time. So like breaking it down in that way is really helpful so people can anticipate, uh, and especially since that's a very um, long-term kind of discussion. This is the fun part and I think it's fun, but also like, it's like how many channels do we have that we're not ex using right now? So key channels, like many of us counselors have newsletters. Some others are good on social media or um, the public forums, of course, is a way we reach out to communities. Um, public comment, the written one, many people don't know still that the town council has that written public comment as a way we can hear from people. The town website, Engage, so we're planning to put the survey on Engage Amherst uh, Community Click is um, a tool that we're collaborating with UMass. Tell me if it's information overload at this point. <laughs> I feel like I've like <laughs> turned a lot at y'all, but um, 
but this is something I think we can keep building the inventory of the channels and community partners. Like I feel, um, you know, what we're planning to do with rental registration is like Mandy Jo writes a small blurb about once we have the survey, we're creating a survey right now uh, that is going to go specifically like if you're a re renter, it's going to go to you a certain set, set of questions, but the same set of questions from the point of view of a landlord and the same question from the point of view of a neighbor. So we have the same questions, but we're looking at it from different points of view. And we're going to put that on Amherst Engage website and then hopefully send it send a little blurb. Um, so Mandy Jo as a chair is going to do the blurb, but I am the key community outreach person who will then coordinate with Brianna to send out the surveys. And then I, as the lead community person, will send it to Amherst Indy, Amherst Current, talk to, uh, because it involves students, we, we send it out to Tony and Sally. Uh, so depending on who is being impacted, um, the key committee outreach person for that project can be the one who coordinates uh, so that it doesn't fall on the chair. And then how do we measure success? Like we kind of, at the end of the process, we kind of take a few moments to see like what was the participation. It's, I don't think this is gonna miraculously improve <laughs> our participation because it is hard to get people's attention. But I think just being more intentional will allow us to see what channels are working, what's not working. And yes, ordinary people working together can do extraordinary things. Thank you, Shalini. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and I realize after I, I, you got started on that that I hadn't said to Jennifer that Ooh. she could leave after her presentation, but then I thought, you know, this is really very important for what she's doing. So I'm glad that you stayed to see Shalini's presentation on, on her um, the initial go at talking on this. Um, so I'm sure we have many, many questions. Um, I'm going to be true to, to what, I, what I said before, but I do want to offer people a chance to make a comment and then we'll close. Um, anyone want to make a comment of any kind or have we all reached past your awakeness hours? I think so. Um, okay. So thank you, Shalini. Uh, I can see a lot of good work and care in there. What I liked when I, I read through it very quickly was I said, well, she certainly has asked all the questions. I don't know the answer to any of those questions, but it's really useful to have all the questions up there. Um, so that, that's, that's my ring too. So that really did me in. Okay, so are we all set for everybody? We know what we're doing, I think. Um, and Andy, you're gonna find out if you can, what the actual status of that process, the TSO process is, whether it was finalized and voted on, which I kind of remember that it was, but I have no way of proving that. So I really appreciate your following that up. Uh, Paul, do you have any uh, final words of wisdom for us at this moment? Okay, so thank Jennifer you, Paul. Has a, sorry, so I, Jennifer has a hand up. I just want to thank you very much. For, and I appreciate you gave uh, Parking on Lincoln so much uh, time and attention, I appreciate it. And Shalini, I've heard you do great slides and you they're amazing. So <laughs> I wish you'd give a tutorial. Okay, yes, okay. It's Canva, just, just one word, Canva, look it up. Spell it. C-A-N-V-A dot com and it's free and you can create your slides and posters and anything you ever wanted to create. Okay, thank you very much. Wow. Okay, so everybody have a wonderful weekend. Um, and a great 4th of July and town is closed. And Paul, I assume you're gonna go and personally set off all the fireworks, okay? All right, see you in a couple of weeks or when the next town council is whenever, bye-bye. And if anyone has any questions, comments, I think don't reply all, but you can send them to me and then maybe uh -huh. through and, and next time we can have a healthier discussion around it. Good, thank, thank you. you. I will try to do that, thank you. Okay, bye-bye.